As we venture into episode 3, surely nothing supernatural is going on, right? Your mother says hello. She's waiting for you. Uh-oh. It's no magic. Right, there's, an, there's a real explanation for this. I sure hope there is, and in this video, that's exactly what I plan to do. We'll work together at figuring out who's behind these killings, these supernatural occurrences, and most terrifying of all, did Peter actually sleep with Liz? No! I have theories for all of these and more, and be sure to stick around till the very end as I'll be going over the trailers for extra clues on what we could be seeing next. But before we begin, make sure to like and subscribe, and leave your theories on what you think is happening in the comments below. It's pretty deliberate that the opening shot is of the Silver Sky Mine. In my previous videos I've argued that the mine is likely the source of all the strange events going on in Ennis. We know that it's been responsible for the black water coming out of the taps, and its presence may be linked to the English increase of stillbirths. It's not a coincidence then that the episode begins with a birth, one that almost turns grim as the child comes out unable to breathe. It makes me wonder whether this near-fatal birth is linked to the mine. This flashback seven years ago scenes Evangeline Navarro when she worked for the APF, before she was transferred to state troopers. In fact, we'll get to learn the specific case which caused this rift between Liz and Navarro. A man by the name of William Wheeler shot and killed his girlfriend. Navarro and Liz knew that he was a serial abuser, but couldn't legally do anything to stop it, and thus Navarro feels guilty that she didn't do enough to protect this poor woman. Perhaps this is why Liz says she has a compulsion to protect women. Navarro's obsessed with the case. She's got this thing about women who get hurt. One of the women at the birthing center says, What's that bitch doing here? So Navarro isn't liked amongst the community, and it's no wonder she's come to arrest any Kotok for trespassing and destruction of private property at the Silver Sky Mine. It must be a difficult position for Navarro to be in. On the one hand, her people seem to be more or less against the mine, while she works to protect the mine's interests by being a member of the police force. We're now five days into Ennis's constant night, Hank has rallied a bunch of his hunter friends to search for Raymond Clark, the number one suspect in the deaths of the Salal scientists. Hank doesn't really seem to care if Raymond is killed in this process. Hey, you want him alive. Do we? I've long suspected that Hank has some sort of connection with Annie that is yet to be revealed. He didn't want to give up her case files, which were conveniently stored in his home. He didn't disclose information that Annie had visited Salal prior to her murder, and because Raymond and Annie were close, it's possible Raymond knows something about Annie and Hank that would incriminate him, hence why Hank doesn't really care if Raymond is found dead. Now, did anyone else think it was strange that the camera focused on these oranges? A hunter drops some and Navarro will pick one up. An orange is about the exact opposite of something you'd see up in the tundra. One can also be seen briefly in the opening credits, so expect these to have some sort of significance in the episodes ahead. Liz is pissed that Hank has assembled a civilian mob to take down Raymond, something you probably won't find in the police rulebook, but given that this is Alaska, everyone seems to play fast and loose with the rules. For example, Liz gets a vet to examine the corpsicle, even half joking if he'd be able to do a postmortem on the bodies. Liz fakes a conversation with Oliver Tuguk in order to break into his home, Liz will do what it takes to get the job done, even if it means bending the rules. Navarro seems to be more by the book. I mean, just look at her reaction when she finds out Liz is going to break into this dude's home. At the station, Liz lies to Peter about what actually happened with William Wheeler. She says, They're about dead when we got there. But in our flashback, we see that he's still alive. What if Liz or Navarro shot William right there, and the two covered it up to make it look like a murder-suicide? It's a murder-suicide. Then there's this weird whistling tune. Whistling isn't something new that evil characters have done in True Detective. In season one, Errol Childress would often whistle, although a markedly different tune. My best guess is that this is a tune made for the show, as I tried shazamming it and humming it to my friends and family, and none of them had a clue where it was from. So if you know where it's from, let us all know in the comments. There are over 19 boxes of evidence associated with Raymond Clark, most of which come from his secret trailer. The big question regarding Annie and Raymond is why keep their relationship a secret? The irony isn't lost on Liz when they're confused why someone would have a secret relationship, when both she and Navarro have secret relationships of their own. 
alone. Liz with Connolly and Navarro with Kavik. Raymond and Annie seem like a happy couple, so why would Raymond, if he is a murderer, want to kill her? Liz observes that one of the photos isn't like the others. It's candid, suggesting someone else took it. Someone else knew of Annie and Raymond's relationship. And it doesn't take long to link the blue hair dye to that of local hairdresser Susan. For over six years, Susan withheld information that Annie met Raymond while she and her were giving haircuts to the men at the research station. Or at least that's what Liz and Navarro originally thought. After Annie's death, Susan let the police know about her connection with Salal, but this is the first Liz has ever heard of this. Susan told Hank, but Hank never documented it, stating that it's not his job to keep track of who sleeps with who in town. This raises some serious red flags for Hank. In fact, based on the evidence we currently have, Hank is my leading suspect for who killed Annie. We know he kept Annie's files, didn't disclose Susan's information, wanted Annie's lover Raymond dead, has a propensity for violence, sleeps around, like he said Susan did, and is even chummy with Kate McKittrick of the Silver Sky Mine, an enemy of Annie's. And did anyone else notice that when Kate talks to Hank, she calls him Henry? Hi, Henry. Is that just a mistake, or is there something more here? I'm counting on you. Don't be suspicious. Don't be suspicious. Susan tells Navarro that Raymond was fixated on Annie's spiral tattoo, a tattoo that came to Annie in dreams. Last episode, Rose said this symbol is older than Ennis itself, which gives it this mystical quality. If you want to know a little more about this symbol and its connection with Season 1, make sure to check out my Episode 2 video. Susan had also been seeing one of the Salal men, Oliver Tuguk, the station's former equipment manager. There are no records of this Oliver guy anywhere, and Susan says he's a guy that doesn't want to be found. A little bit suspicious. On the car ride back, we learn how over half of Ennis's population works at the mine, so a lot of people would have a vested interest in keeping this thing open. A lot of people would want Annie dead. If Hank hasn't been suspicious enough, one of the first things he asks Pete down at the rink is, What's Danvers up to? Pete asks his dad about what happened between Liz and Navarro those years ago. You know what happened there? She won't tell me. This is pretty sneaky, as Liz told him what happened a few hours ago. Either he's asking this because he didn't believe Liz's side of the story and he's trying to catch her in a lie, or he's seeing what his father will say. Hank responds, No idea which seems like a total lie. Keep this in mind when Liz throws Hank's coffee in his face and doesn't reprimand him after Hank makes the not-so-subtle accusation that she slept with Peter. Maybe I ought to file a report on you for playing Mrs. Robinson with my kid. This, of course, being a reference to Dustin Hoffman and Anne Bancroft's characters in The Graduate in which an older woman seduces a younger man. Mrs. Robinson, you're trying to seduce me. Now, did they actually sleep together? While possible, I don't think so. Remember that Peter has lost his mother, and Liz has lost her son, so I think the more likely scenario is that they're each using each other to fill these holes in their life. There's even this brief moment where Liz touches his face to make sure he's okay. I just get way more of a mother-son vibe from them than anything sexual. Twice this season, Peter has chosen Liz over being with his wife. Again, you could take this as being a sexual thing, but I see it more as a son being at the beck and call of his mother. So if this accusation isn't true, then why didn't Liz kick the shit out of Hank or at least reprimand him? I think it's because Hank really knows what happened in that Wheeler case. That either Liz or Navarro shot Wheeler and Liz can't do shit to Hank because he has something on her. That's just my take. Let me know what you think in the comments. Turns out that forensic tech Liz requested isn't able to fly in due to inclement weather, so Peter suggests he get his cousin, a veterinarian, to take a look before the bodies are shipped off to Anchorage. This is Vincent, and the big piece of information he gives us is that the bodies died before they froze. The most likely scenario is cardiac arrest. It's no coincidence he brings up caribou leaping off cliffs, just like we saw in episode one. But I've seen caribou's die of plane fright. If there's someone who knows the whereabouts of the elusive Oliver, it's Kavik, who knows some of the more shady characters in town due to his home brew business. In exchange for this information, he simply wants to know something about Navarro, and this is hard for her because she's so closed off. She tells him about her childhood, one filled with an abusive father and mentally ill mother who ventured off one night and was murdered. This is likely why she cares so much about protecting women and joined the force. She doesn't want what happened to her happening to us others. Continuing her rebellious streak, Lee joins up with Sherry to attend an anti-mine rally. And there are three really interesting things I want to point out here. 
first is the black water, likely taken from the taps to show people what the mine has done. Liz will see this for herself when she goes to wash her hands. The second bit of information is that the town has just had another stillbirth, the key word here being another. The implication is that the mine is the cause of this. And finally, take a look at the picture of these caribou in the back. Check out the eyes. They kind of look like those burnt corneas on the frozen scientists and this weird glimmer we saw on Travis's in episode one. Now, did any of you happen to notice that Liz is just listening to static? Does she realize she's doing that? We've heard static sounds before, on Rose's radio before she sees Travis, and also in Navarro's car before she sees the polar bear. The static always seems to precede something supernatural. Now, did any of you clock this strange clip? It's almost as if she's noticing something. The static is still in the background. It's just all around weirdness. This is just before Lee comes home and Liz demands she take off that temporary tattoo. I talked more about Liz's contempt for indigenous culture in my episode two video, but she once again demands that Lee remove this tattoo, a metaphor for the literal wiping out of her culture. All Lee really wants is for Liz to care about what's going on in town. Liz doesn't seem too concerned about the mine, at least in comparison to Lee. And when push comes to shove, of, Liz will be called in to protect the mine should any protests happen, so you can see a lot of potential for conflict here. Upon leaving Kavik's fishing shack, Navarro experiences a vision of a small child. This is Liz's son, Holden Danvers, who we can see here in the credits. He's holding the one-eyed polar bear plushie that Liz found under her bed and again in this box, telling Navarro to quote, get his mommy. When Navarro conks her head on the ice, she is transported to this barren land, which looks a lot like the one from her flashback in episode one. Navarro used to be in the military, and this looks to be some sort of destroyed convoy. My best guess, we're in Afghanistan. Besides staving off a head injury, Navarro has to deal with her sister, who's been experiencing increasingly dangerous bouts of mental illness. Jules' big concern is that she'll wind up like her mother, who had similar problems. The scene taking place behind an abandoned ship at sea mimics Jules' mental illness and loneliness, that feeling of being distant from everyone else. And that seems to be a major theme of not only this episode, but the season. What do you do when you're lonely? Liz attends what appears to be the wake for the stillbirth of that child. This situation makes her visibly hot and uncomfortable, having to take a moment in the bathroom. No doubt she must feel for someone who has lost a child since she lost one herself. Liz and Navarro track down Oliver at a nomad camp along the North Shore, and he isn't too pleased when the cops come showing up at his door, entering without a warrant, no less. There's this interesting back and forth about him wanting to know Navarro's Inupiaq name. Oh. You forgot, didn't you? The sad tragedy of it all is she never learned it from her mother, while this guy probably thinks she's just turned her back on her heritage. When he finds out his former colleagues at Salal passed away, he is visibly saddened, quickly turning to rage, shooing the detectives out. I personally think he wasn't involved in the murders, but with him being in charge of the scientific equipment, I wouldn't be surprised if he makes another appearance. At the hospital, Dr. Lund, the lone survivor of the corpsicle, has regained consciousness, having his legs and an arm amputated and no longer being able to see. He has a chilling message for the detective, stating that we woke her, she's awake, she's out there in the ice, she came for us in the dark. The big question is, who is he talking about? The first person that comes to mind is Annie. We'll see her in this ice, so to speak, in the video of the cavern on her phone. But Annie's dead, making this all the more mysterious. Maybe the she he is referring to is something more out of the box, referring to something like the organisms found in their samples, or Mother Nature herself. Again, the question arises, can this be explained with science, or are we dealing with something truly supernatural? And while Liz goes to handle some rowdy hunters, Navarro is left alone, and Lund has a spooky message for her. Your mother says hello. She's waiting for you. To our knowledge, Navarro and Lund have never met, so how would he know about her mother? I don't think this happened. I think this was all in Navarro's head. In episode two, her mother does this weird pointing gesture, the same thing Lund will do here. Remember that she just bonked her head, so she might not be thinking straight. Plus, she's had all sorts of visions from her military days to a one-eyed polar bear. We cannot take what she sees at face value. The episode ends with Peter having unlocked and discovered a video on Annie's phone. Here Annie explores some sort of ice cavern, stating, I found it. It's here. 
Whatever it is is likely what got her killed, as we'll hear her screaming in pain. This might be a bit of a stretch, but is this black outline here forming a spiral or some other drawing? It's also important to note that Annie's phone was found at the trailer, not at the bottom of some ice cavern. So Annie either escaped this encounter or it was brought back up by someone else. Maybe this was Raymond Clark, but if it was Raymond who murdered her, then why leave a phone that has evidence like this on it? This episode left us with far more questions than it did answers, but we still have more to dive into. Now we move on to our trailer sleuthing section where we take a look at the season's trailers to see if there are any clues as to what will happen next. Note that I won't be going over every shot, just the ones I think are important to the story. We still have yet to see this shot of Liz being interviewed. It's similar to Rust and Marty's interviews in season one, so this is either a case before the events of the show or her being questioned after. We have this picture of someone wearing Annie's jacket at the Salal station. I wonder if this was a shot they were going to use in episode one, but thought it was too much of a giveaway. My guess is that this is either Raymond Clark or this guy. Liz makes her way back to Salal station, so something must be bringing her back here. A spiral at this abandoned factory. In this wide shot, we'll see a radio and campfire. Looks like someone has been hanging out here. Someone with that pink jacket that runs atop the catwalk. Again, is it Raymond or this guy? Navarro comes face to face with a wet haired Jules. Is this another one of Navarro's visions or has Jules crept out into the frozen tundra naked like those scientists? Lee smears black paint over her face suggesting she continues on with her protests at the mine. Navarro embracing Liz here by the fire, it looks like they've been through hell. Check out Navarro here, not in uniform, inside what appears to be the same cave Annie was in. In this other shot we see Navarro again, not in her uniform, but this time at Salal. Could something happen that gets Navarro kicked off the case? Or even Liz for that matter, as when we see her here, she's also not in her uniform. We haven't seen this shot of Jules really going through some sort of psychotic break. This is what will likely force Navarro to put her in the hospital, something she promised she wouldn't do. Here's Lee getting the shit kicked out of her at the mine protest. We'll later see that Navarro is a riot officer here. Is this part of her state trooper duties? Did she get demoted? Or are we dealing with two different protests, one with Lee in present day and one with Annie in the past. We do get this shot of Annie haunting Navarro while she's in her riot gear. This is one of my favorite shots. Last episode I theorized this is Peter judging by his jacket and boots, with the body in the background here being that of his father's. A person, perhaps Raymond, making his way down an ice tunnel. Here's the dead woman from the Wheeler case pointing at someone, likely Navarro, since both Lund and her mother did the same exact gesture. This gesture is also seen with this boy who may or may not be Liz's son, Holden. Navarro and Liz, whose red coat you can see in the bottom right here, tie up maybe Raymond? The same person we'll see dragging Navarro across the Salal station. In this shot of the man tied up, take a look at the glass on the floor here. It seems to match up with Liz breaking free of the freezer at the station. Remember that orange from earlier in the episode? It makes an appearance to Jules rolling under her bed. A pool of blood at Liz's home with someone carrying a bunch of cleaning supplies. And it looks like Liz and Navarro make their way to that ice cavern where Annie's video was taken. There's still a lot more to get through as True Detective has three more episodes left, and I hope you'll stick with me as we get closer and closer to the end. Thanks for watching, please be sure to like and subscribe, and leave your thoughts and theories about the show in the comments below. For more bad takes, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time, remember, Daddy loves you very much.